Well, psilocybin can be contrasted to any compound. It's different from all other compounds, including all other psychedelics. Psilocybin is very interesting and should be studied more deeply because it does things that are quite uh, miraculous, that are very close to the surface. In other words, ordinary scientific mo methods of research, I think, could get at some of this. Uh, the first thing that is astonishing about psilocybin is that of all the psychedelics with, well, yes, of all the psychedelics with the possible exception of DMT, which is a whole special case, psilocybin is the most easily capable of generating visions. And that fascinated me. I took a lot of LSD and I was really hyped for LSD. I had read, I was waiting, I was fully informed and prepared by the time I got to my first LSD trip. And I was somewhat puzzled by it. It did completely take me apart. And I thought many strange things and had many insights, but I had thought that it would be like the Havelock Ellis description the ruined cities dripping with jewels, the vast jungles, the strange machinery, all that. Uh-uh. Later I discovered that by smoking good Bombay black hash on LSD, you can sort of coax that into existence. <laughs> but an easier thing is psilocybin. Psilocybin just causes you to hallucinate furiously. And I am, I don't understand how people can take this so casually. I mean, maybe we need to talk about the, the uh, taxonomy of hallucination. When I say hallucination, I'm not talking about the walls breathing or something like that. I'm not even talking about those little things that look like fans that go <laughs> that are on like that cover everything like wallpaper you know when you open your eyes I mean those are hallucinations of some sort I think they're called hypnagogia or edetic phosphenes or something but that's all in the visual pathway that's about the eye what I'm interested in at that point is not the eye but the mind and on psilocybin my god you know Red velvet draperies are raised to an enormous organ tone, and then you just sail off into the most grandiose and extravagant architectonic unfoldment. I mean, there are no words for it. You don't know whether you're in a cyber remake of Shark Cathedral or you're inside somebody's television set or you're walking around inside some kind of organism from Arturus or what is going on. And after a good psilocybin trip, you know, your eyes are like bugging out of your head. I mean, you have spent, it's like going to Upper Madison Avenue with money in your pocket. You have just been looking and looking and looking for hours and hours. And all, and this stuff, I, before I got, or as I was getting into all this, my interest was union psychology and art history. The fields which set you up for being able to recognize motifs trace them through time and understand how the various art movements of whatever centuries you're looking at fit together and and plus a deep faith in the architect uh, archetypal foundations of human imagery and so forth none of that was there it was as i said a niagara of alien beauty it was uh beyond anticipating it was that I, Joe Nobody, in an hour, seemed to be seeing more art of higher quality than the human family had produced in the last thousand years. And for me, it was, first of all, an absolute aesthetic ecstasy to see that much stuff, to hit 
the main frame and then say, oh, I see. So this is what they're talking about. Not all that babbling about looking at the folds of your trousers and, you know, but this, this is something. I mean, this is civilization shattering stuff. I don't see how they keep the lid on it. Um, and I still don't see how they keep the lid on it. However, that, it turns out, is not the most interesting, or, uh, well, it may be the most interesting, it is not the most unique feature of psilocybin. The, without doubt, in my mind, the most unique feature of psilocybin is that it speaks. It speaks in your native tongue. And that is absolutely confounding to the rational mind. I mean, that's what makes a believer out of most skeptics. Because, you know, drugs, of course, you can imagine that a drug would mess with your mind and you would see strange things. That doesn't seem too over the top. But that you could take a drug that would drop a heavy hand on your shoulder and say, my friend, there are a few things you need to understand. Number one, number two. Meanwhile, you know, you're bursting into tears. You're abreacting furiously because it's right. It's wiser than you could have possibly imagined. And it knows you better than you know yourself. And it's not wasting time. It's cutting to the chase. And this is astonishing to me. Who's in there? Who's in there? Is it the mushroom? Is it just straightforwardly that this thing growing on a cow pie in the pasture somehow has the capacity to unfold itself in my mind and lecture me on quantum physics, art history, geo, you know, the history of the galaxy, the destiny of the species, or, or w what is going on there exactly? We when someone tells you stuff you've never heard before, as fast as you can take it in, the only mode we know for that is conversation. And so you must assume you're having a conversation with someone at that point. And the, the information is, you know, so puzzling. I mean, I believe that on a good psilocybin trip, you not only see things no one has ever seen before, but what you're seeing, no one will ever see again. That's how big it is in there. You know, it, it is beyond uh, the can of the human imagination. Uh, why is it like that? Well, that's a very interesting question. Rupert says, I mean, this is a, a, just a stab at it, that these molecules not only give trips, they record them. And when you take a, a substance that has been in use by human beings for half a million years, let's say, you walk into the largest database on the planet of dreams, of hopes, of aesthetic insights. Uh, uh, not only the human world, but all the other worlds that the mushroom claims to have flourished in. Because it is not a terrestrial organism. It's engineered for deep space. It can percolate between the stars. In the course of a million years, it, at sublight speed, it could percolate across the galaxy. And a million years is a tiny fraction of the time that it may have been in existence. Uh, the miracle is that it will have anything to do with us. That it is a being so enlightened, so unperturbed, that it will actually stop whatever it's doing and talk to you. And you have the feeling when you're dealing with it, it's totally claiming all of your attention, but you have the feeling that it is something much more like the Bell, the ITT International Phone Net or something, that many of these conversations are going on. And it will answer any question you can ask. 
the bigger you can frame it, the easier it is for it to answer it. And so it shows you, you know, the rise and fall of worlds, species, and civilizations, galaxies like grains of sand. I mean, it says, been there, done that. It's all here. Um, And so I think that the Gaian mind produces these things and that they are like pheromones. They are information-bearing chemicals. And it's a great mystery. It is the mystery. I have scoured this planet, done yoga, done this, done that, scratched pentacles in sand, made monstrous offerings at crossroads under the dark of a scorpionic moon, done it, been there, all that stuff. Nothing works. It's all horseshit. Nothing works (laughs) except this. And this works. Not a little, not 50%, but a thousand percent. It's like the thing that you have been most trained to accept doesn't exist. It does exist. They were wrong. They lied to you for some weird reason. This is the secret which is not supposed to be told. And why I can tell it, I'm not sure. Nobody ever came to me and said, you mustn't. You're part of the brotherhood. You're an initiate. You must keep silent. Nobody ever said that to me. And I've never been initiated by anybody particularly. I learned this stuff by reading the Boston Museum Botanical Leaflets and then, you know, putting tummy on the line and uh, it, it, it's, the, it's a secret which dwarfs the enterprise of human history. And all that is required for you to be a part of it is a simple act of courage. You know, Nobody goes to the ashram at 9 o'clock in the morning with their knees knocking in terror and dread at what they know is about to sweep over them. That's because... Yoga doesn't do that. Nothing puts you on the line like this does because this is what you say you want. You know, it's easy to be on the spiritual path. You know, you just try one screwy thing after another and go forward. But when you arrive at this level, the name of the game changes. You sought the answer, you got it. Now what are you going to do with it? Uh, It's terrifying to me. I have no doubt that if I wanted to be um, the monk on Cold Mountain and go up into the mist and chop wood and every once in a while the village people every year or two would say, oh yes, he's still up there. We glimpsed him naked in the snow. Uh, He lives in a cave. I could do that. But the price you pay when you finally find the tool of ultimate transcendence is that you will become incomprehensible to your fellow human beings because they are not where you are. They are caught up in the idols of the tribe. They live in the anthill. They're worrying about, uh, you know, the oil leaks in their jaguar. And... uh, But it's a different thing. All other spiritual disciplines drive with the accelerator to the floor. You know, that's how you do it. When you come to psychedelics, suddenly there arises a great interest in locating the brakes. The brakes become all important because you can now proceed at whatever rate you wish. It's no longer what Baba says or when the next workshop by Dr. So-and-so is held. It's now you have been given the power to move as far and as fast into this dimension as you want. And the, the joys are absolutely real and so are the risks. Uh, we don't know what the limits of the human mind are. We don't know how much you can gaze upon and still, uh, you know, 
play any role in the social community. I mean, I'm a graduate of the H.P. Lovecraft school of this stuff. You know, there are, there are some truths too bizarre for the mind to even brush against. And I've had that feeling with the mushroom. I mean, sometimes we, because we have dialogues, Hasidic, great, raving Hasidic dialogues. Uh, and one of the things I have said to it at times is, show me yourself. Show me what you are, not for the talking monkeys. Show me what you are for yourself. And it's terrifying. I mean, the temperature drops about 15 degrees in about 15 seconds, and there's a low organ tone, and black draperies begin to rise. And after about two minutes of this, you just say, that's enough, <laughs> thank you, of what you are for yourself. Let's go back to the dancing mice, the cheerful paisleys, <laughs> my relationship, and uh, what we think about human history, but no more, because, because it is beyond comprehension. It's the real thing, folks what all these people were talking about on the mountains, in the cave. And the strange thing is, it's among us. It's completely among us and uh, can be pursued by anybody, by any free-thinking human being. And I don't ultimately know what it means. Uh, out of it, I, it's given me, I believe, a complete map of human history. That was, that's the equivalent of trading a knife and a can of sardines to a starving Witoto in some baboon asshole outpost on a river. It meant nothing to it to give me a complete map of human history and a new vision of higher mathematics. They've got trade goods like that lined up from here to Hosanna. And so it's just all about, you know, what you are willing to ask for. I don't know what it means. I, I don't believe in believing. I don't believe in drawing conclusions. But I do believe that life is a staggering opportunity for adventure. I mean, people who are complaining that things are too dull haven't the faintest notion of how weird it can get in a hurry if that's what you're interested in. Yeah. And now, uh, from the 